Students often find the task of planning the synthesis of an organic molecule to be pretty daunting. It doesn't have to be. Let me give you a few tips that will get you set to do well in planning organic synthesis. First, know the reaction facts. I don't mean be sort of familiar with them. Think of it this way. Suppose somebody is wanting to play chess and they're sort of familiar with the way the pieces move. They know that some move diagonally and some move vertically and horizontally only. They know that some can jump, but this isn't all real well straight in their mind. So as they play the chess game, they're going to be referring to notes and maybe guessing from time to time. Do you think that person is likely to win that chess game? Same way with the reaction facts. If you don't know those reaction facts, as well as you know the names of your friends, you're going to be struggling with the facts rather than using those facts to plan the strategy of the synthesis. So know these reaction facts really well. Secondly, organize that knowledge of reactions by what functional groups they make. Initially, we focused on the reactions of functional groups. For example, you learned that alkynes add water to make ketones or to make aldehydes. Now you need to learn that same chemistry and think of it as ways to make ketones and ways to make aldehydes. It's the same knowledge, but it's turned around. So now you're focusing on the target, what you can make. As you organize your knowledge of these reactions, Make lists. Make a list of every functional group that you've learned how to make, and then list the ways for every functional group that you know how to make them. The good news is that right now, those lists will be very short. So it's pretty easy to learn these lists. If you wait until later on in this course or the second semester, you'll find that the list of ways to make each functional group has grown, and it'll be a bigger task. So organize your knowledge now by what functional groups they make, make lists, memorize them. There are really three kinds of things that you're doing in chemical reactions, and it sort of helps to recognize what each is and organize your lists according to that. One of the kinds of reactions is simply transforming one functional group into another, and you'll have lists that are doing simply that. Another type of reaction is making carbon-carbon bonds. And this is special because it lets you build larger molecules from the smaller starting materials that you have. So the ways to make carbon-carbon bonds is really key. And right now you only know one. So this turns out to make your life pretty simple. Soon you'll know more than one and you'll want to have a good grasp on each of the ways to make carbon-carbon bonds. Thirdly, you know that there are ways to cleave carbon-carbon bonds. We've seen this for double bonds, for instance, alkenes. And this is actually a very special way to make functional groups. So think of it that way and take a look at the functional groups that you can make by cleaving carbon-carbon bonds. Next on my list of tips, embrace retrosynthetic analysis. This is a new kind of problem-solving reasoning most people are not accustomed to it, and it's hard to get used to. As short as these synthetic problems are that you're seeing, you may be able to solve them without using this strategy, but it's the best strategy for success, and it's a reasoning strategy that will help you in other contexts as well. Let me give you one example quickly that may be meaningful to you. Uh, a few years ago, there was a person in Florida, a man who came down with anthrax, highly contagious disease. They were very concerned about how he had contracted it. Now, one of the things they could have done to figure out how he might have contracted it is made a long list of all the ways he could have contracted it and then started thinking about them and maybe ruling some out. That's not what they did. What they did was take a shortcut approach. They said, okay, let's look at this man and let's look what he did today and let's look what he did yesterday and let's look what he did the day before working backwards in time to look at just those things that he did that could have led to contracting anthrax. And in fairly short order, they discovered that he had taken a trip to Georgia and had an opportunity to be exposed to anthrax in a specific place, and they had the problem solved. They worked backwards rather than thinking of everything 
and then trying to rule things out and narrow things down. Retrosynthetic analysis is the same type of thing. We are focusing on reactions that we know will make the target, reactions that we know will make the precursor we need. So everything we're planning will be useful to make the target. A shortcut approach in reasoning compared to the daunting task of listing all the compounds that we might start with and then trying to guess which one will be best. Bottom line, embrace retrosynthetic analysis. It's a good reasoning strategy. And finally, practice, practice, practice. Look at all the problems in the book. Look at all the problems on the quizzes. Work them all. Think about what you are, can learn from those, not just memorizing them. That won't help you because on exams, you are going to see synthesis problems for structures that you haven't looked at before. But look at what they're training you to do. Focus on ways to make ketones. For instance, aha, I need to make a ketone. I know that I could do a hydration of an alkyne. I know that I could do cleavage of an alkene. And zero in on the chemistry that let you make ketones effectively. Or looking at the stereochemistry of a molecule. The stereochemistry can give you solid clues about what chemistry you can and cannot use. For instance, if you need to have a specific chirality at a secondary center, you better make that with a reaction that will let you control the stereochemistry. That sounds like an SN2 substitution reaction, doesn't it? Or possibly electrophilic addition under certain conditions. Another clue that you look for are adjacent functional groups. When two functional groups occur on adjacent carbons, there's a good chance they were made simultaneously in the same chemical reaction, like the chemistry you make one, two diols that you know. And see. So be aware of the structural clues that you can see that will give you cues to the kind of chemistry that you want to consider. And that you can do as you practice, 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 do all the synthesis problems you can get your hands on. And finally, a word about that. I noticed that your book author, Klein, suggests that you make up your own synthesis problems and practice on those. I think I would be careful about that because I've found in the past that students easily think of structures as synthetic targets that are very hard to make. Probably not possible to make reasonably with the chemistry you know. And in cases like that, then, not only are you struggling, but perhaps you're learning some bad habits as you try to make the chemistry you know fit. So my advice is stick to the problems that you can see on quizzes, stick to the problems that you can see in the book. That will give you plenty of practice. Bottom line, these simple tips, you see there aren't many, will prepare you well to succeed when you're planning organic synthesis.